Please welcome Greg Sheridan to present on the topic, Christianity's contribution to society. Well, Michael, uh, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. Now, I'm getting my phone out because my watch doesn't work. And uh, I, I resemble Fidel Castro in one respect a tendency to give addresses which go for eight or nine hours. And uh, in order to... Now, I understand, you know, one of the favourite doctrines that we Catholics have, which no-one else has, is the doctrine of purgatory. And the great joy of purgatory is that it's, a, you know, it's the only place where a journalist's got any chance of, uh, of ending up happily. But the other great joy of purgatory is that for an experience like you're about to endure for the next 30, 25 minutes or so, think of the time off you'll get in purgatory. It's, uh, um, I also recall um, uh, um, a remark <clears throat> the American politician Adlai Stevenson made in a similar circumstance to the one he finds that I find myself in tonight. For the next 25 minutes or so, he said, it's, it's my job to talk, it's your job to listen. If you should finish your job before I finish my job, no hard feelings uh, whatsoever. Now, um, I want to thank Michael very much for inviting me here today, although I'm a bit intimidated because we journalists like to talk to audiences who don't know anything about the subject. So could I instead speak to you about the role of dance in opera or something <laughs> like that, uh, rather than Christianity? Um, and it's a bit intimidating here in Cathedral House for, a, for an old Christian Brothers boy, you know, whose fondest memory is of getting the strap and, uh, you know, uh, generally being a lout uh, to, end up, um, to end up addressing you in this, in this hallowed hall. Now, I'll just tell you about this book for a couple of minutes before I address the particular topic that Michael's asked me to address. <clears throat> so, um, as, as Michael outlined, I've been a journalist for a disgracefully long period of time and I've stuck in the one job. I'm everything, the opposite of everything you've heard about the need to switch careers and be nimble and, uh, and change and all the rest of it. Uh, they'll, they'll drag me away from my desk. The claw marks of my nails will, will be there. But uh, about four years ago, I wrote my last book, When We Were Young and Foolish, and I went to a lot of writers' festivals, Byron Bay, the Sydney Writers' Festival, the Melbourne Writers' Festival, a lot of others, and I saw hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of books being promoted, and there was not one that was about Christianity or in favour of Christianity. And I thought, this is incredible, because Christianity is so central to our culture, to everything that we are. Even if you don't believe in Christianity, how can it be that it's whited out of the culture in quite this way. So it was a sort of a challenge, really, to uh, contribute my little thimbleful of, uh, of knowledge to the broad discourse. And then when I started to think how I'd structure the book, um, I took great advice from my publishers, and I ended up, the book is in two halves. The first half is a sort of an essay about the crisis we're in at the moment, where Christianity is in decline in the West. It's not in decline anywhere else. It's on fire in China. It's on fire in Africa. It's on fire in Latin America. But it is in decline in the West, and I think we've got to face that honestly. And to try to confront that by uh, saying why Christianity is true. So the only reason to devote any attention to it is if it's true. So this is not a book that just argues there are a few cultural benefits to Christianity. It argues that Christianity is true, so I try to uh, establish that it's, it's reasonable and rational to believe in God, and I try to have a chapter on what Christians believe, then uh, a chapter which Michael has asked me to talk about tonight, what did we ever get from Christianity, apart from human rights, secular government, the idea of the individual, uh, feminism, environmentalism, uh, the vote... Um, civil discourse and modernity. Apart from that, what did we ever get from Christianity? <laughs> then I, I had a very self-indulgent chapter on the Old Testament because, like a lot of Christian Brothers boys, I grew up not reading a lot of the Old Testament, I've got to tell you. But when you get to it, it's such fun. And I thought, how can we be depriving our young people of this fantastic material? The Old Testament had great sub-editors. It's written a bit more like the da Daily Telegraph than the Australian, but... Uh, <laughs> It is a terrific book. It obeys all the laws of journalism. It names the names. It, uh, it's short sentences. It gets to the point. 
What a great story Jonah is. It's so much fun. It's like a Mel Brooks comedy, but with a fantastically serious point that God is the God of the Ninevites as well as the Israelites. God is universal. The book of Job, the most uh, enthralling and inexhaustible meditation in all of the history of human literature on the problem of innocent suffering. So there's a self-indulgent chapter about that. And then I try to confront the problems of belief, you know, the problem of evil, the problem of innocent suffering, the problems of the crimes of Christians. Anyway, that's kind of the first half of the book. Then the second half of the book is a reported half on what uh, some Christians in Australia are doing. So there's two chapters on the politicians. I inveigled believing Christian politicians to talk publicly about their faith, and I admired all of them who did. It was very hard to get them to do it. Not one of them wanted to do it, and I had to use every form of uh, persuasion, intimidation, moral blackmail, bribery, cajolery. But they all rewarded me with wonderful insights. Um, Bill Shorten, Malcolm Turnbull, Tony Abbott, uh, and lots and lots of others. And then the other chapters are about the tremendous new movements in Christianity, which are full of life. So although there's an overall story of decline in the West for the moment, as there has been at times in the past, and then the church has been great on the rebound, there are these fantastic movements which are alive and, and doing brilliantly. The new ecclesial movements in the Catholic Church, that magnificent um, Campion College in Western Sydney, the Liberal Arts College uh, with a Catholic outlook. The, uh, there's a revival of Benedictine monasticism in Australia. And oddly enough, on Friday I'm going to visit a new monastery in Tasmania, which is full of recruits and has increased in its size 300% or something since I wrote about it uh, for my book. But I also tried to be non-denominational in the book and, and appeal to all Christians who could recite the Apostles' Creed, not just Catholics like ourselves. And I found great uh, energy and strength and dynamism amongst Pentecostal Christians and amongst Evangelical Christians as well. And I think there's a bit of a... Um, a de facto alliance between Catholics and Pentecostals and Evangelicals. Certainly, while my preference for church music is Gregorian chant, um, the Pentecostals have very good rock and roll Christian music. If you like rock and roll, it's very good. That's a long-winded way of getting to the subject tonight, which is what does our civic culture owe to Christianity? Now, there's, there's a kind of a Disneyland version of history and even this is not known to young people today or, or taught in our schools or anything because no version of history is. But there's a sort of a Disneyland version of Christian history which says Jesus was a nice bloke, uh, very good social worker, kind of Mahatma Gandhi figure of his time, would have believed in paid maternity leave if it had been available. Uh, uh, and his first followers tried to live according to his uh, ideas. They got persecuted for it. And then along came Emperor Constantine in the 4th century, made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire, and it then became coercive and oppressive and a state religion, and you got a thousand years of superstitious rule by wicked, <coughs> wicked priests and clerics, and uh, nothing good happened after the Roman Empire. It was the Dark Ages. Nothing good happened for a thousand years until you got to the Renaissance, and that was lovely because... Everybody started eating smashed avocados and going to art galleries and looking at pictures of naked uh, people and statues uh, of naked people. And, and then along came after that the Protestant Reformation, which was dispensing with superstition. And then along after that came um, the Enlightenment. And mankind turned his back on God. And everything since then has been yippity-boo and fantastic in human history. And that is more or less the authorised... Um, liberal, secular version of Christian history. And the problem with that version of history is that every speck of it is wrong. Everything about it is the reverse of the truth. Now, in, in my chapter, I draw on a number of scholars, a number of biographers of Aquinas and Augustine and so on. But the, the chapter is really a homage to the work of one great Oxford scholar, Larry Siddentop, who... Um, after you've read this book, the next book I'd recommend for you, uh, if you're going to read one more book in your life, is Larry Siddentop's book called Inventing the Individual, The Origins of Western Civilization." Siddentop is a great Oxford scholar, 
I don't think he's a believing Christian of any kind. I, I may be doing him injustice there, but that's what I'm told. And he investigates the emergence of the Western, the unique Western civic culture, and he comes to the scholar's conclusion that this was not a product of the renunciation of Christianity. It all flowed directly out of Christianity. So even if you go back before Christianity again to the Old Testament, the most radical pro-human rights statement in the ancient world was the statement in the book of Genesis that God created human beings in his own image. This was a very revolutionary idea for the ancient world. Creation was good, God created the universe, and he created human beings in the likeness of God. Nobody had made a claim like that for human nature before uh, the book of Genesis. Then along came Christianity with an absolutely revolutionary <coughs> message of universalism. In the ancient world, uh, <coughs> there had been no rights for slaves, no rights for foreigners, not many rights for younger sons, and not many rights for women and girls. It was really male heads of family. And, and even when uh, the Greeks said mankind is the, is the measure of everything, what they meant was property owning male heads of families. Christianity said, famously, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, you are all one in Christ Jesus. The first great statement in favour of secular government came in the Gospels when Jesus said, render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, render unto God that which is God's. And from the very first, Christianity understood that uh, slaves had immortal souls. Uh, the doctrine of the soul was not completely formed in the New Testament, but it was understood that slaves were human beings and had immortal destiny. And in the book of uh, Philemon, uh, Paul tells uh, Philemon that he must treat the slave as though he were welcoming Paul himself, that the slave is his brother. Similarly, uh, the first great sexual revolution was brought about by Christianity, which had a revolutionary idea about the role of women and girls. The uh, Christian sexual morality meant that uh, slave owners could not mistreat their slaves. It also meant that marriage was an institution of reciprocal love and affection. That was, had never been the case in the ancient world. Sometimes it had been the case in practice, but it had never been the theory of marriage, so to speak, in the ancient world. So this was a revolutionary doctrine. And um, a sociologist of history, who uh, I quote a bit, Rodney, uh, Rodney Stark, argues that really it is the treatment of women and girls which is the great innovation of Christianity and which leads to its spread. So in the ancient world, it was very common to practice female infanticide, to kill the girl babies and to favour sons. Christian families didn't do that, so they had a lot more daughters. As a result, they were much happier families. They got lots of female converts because they treated women and girls so much better. All the blokes uh, then married these women and girls, and so naturally they did as their wives told them and converted to Christianity. And that was really the engine of the spread of Christianity. But then Siddentop argues that the long dialogue which Christianity had internally all through the Middle Ages really laid the basis for everything we now regard as liberalism and modern civic identity. So for example, very early on, a pope decided that infidels had human souls and therefore they had human rights. So the rights did not only belong to believers. Although it took a long time to abolish slavery, popes and bishops from very early on were denouncing it. You cannot own another human being. Who do you think you are that you can own another human being? And, uh, Gregory of Nyssa, in a famous passage, said, this does not belong to you, it belongs only to God. And then he said, in fact, it doesn't even belong to God because God has given human dignity to each person and he doesn't revoke his gifts. So uh, this is an irrevocable gift of God's to each, uh, to each human individual. There was a long dialogue about what was a crime and what was a sin, uh, what the state should regulate and what the church should regulate. Some popes thought the church should regulate everything, but uh, they, they could never uh, impose that, and most of them didn't think that. The Christian view became that there had to be separate spheres. The development of church governance 
liberated people from the tyranny of local lords and the tyranny of their own families very often. The long contemplation of what were the limits of authority and what were the limits of conscience. So Augustine and Aquinas, for example, both shared the view, which I, I was surprised to find out, for example, that prostitution should not be a crime. They thought it was a great moral evil, a great wicked thing, but they thought it was inevitable and it was not useful for the state to try to outlaw it. It only made things worse. Now, they might have been wrong about that, but what was interesting was the clear understanding, even in the time of Augustine and much amplified in the time of Aquinas, that the, the state could not enforce all aspects of private morality that there was a, a realm of morality and a realm of conscience. Aquinas developed the doctrine of the conscience very greatly. Um, he even wrote that a Muslim who converts to Christianity against the beliefs of his conscience is committing an outrage that he should remain a Muslim if he doesn't conscientiously believe in Christianity, he shouldn't convert simply because of, uh, of force or advantage or anything like that. That the dictates of conscience were paramount. Now that doesn't mean you can do whatever you like, but that means you have a right always to do what is right. And this right to do what is right cannot be abridged by the state or by your parents or uh, by anybody else. The Christian dialogue about these matters produced extraordinary innovations. So in the, was it the fifth or the sixth century, Benedict founded really modern monasticism. This was a revolutionary move in medieval uh, Europe because it was the first completely egalitarian institution. Benedict's rule is still in print. 1,500 years later, I bought a copy in a bookshop in Melbourne, and it's very clear. It says, whether the monk was formerly a noble person, formerly a free landholder, or formerly a slave, within the monastery, everybody is the same. They wear the same habit, they have no rank uh, resulting from birth or social status, everybody is equal. Nobody owns any property and they all obey the same rules. The monasteries also were the first democratic community because the monasteries elected their own abbot. So this was a revolution in human affairs. And they were leading the best kind of Christian life and yet they were labouring every day in the fields. So this gave a dignity to labour, which had never been there before, because in, arist in aristocratic societies, the object of the aristocrat is always to avoid labour. Medieval Christian societies invented experimental science. This came directly from uh, a Christian understanding of God and his creation. So God was rational, and his creation to some extent embodied the order and rationality of God himself. So looking for the patterns in creation was discovering God's mind in creation. Not only that, but the natural universe was not full of sprites and spirits and warring polytheistic gods. It was just natural. There wasn't really a, you know, I mean, I speak as an Irishman, of course, full of superstition, you know, and we believe that every tree has a leprechaun and a ghost and so on, but but medieval Christians came to understand that there wasn't a sprite in the, in, the, in the river. There wasn't a spirit behind the tree. There were natural causes, and they discovered these natural causes. And Western civilization became the only civilization to develop experimental science, which grew directly out of um, Christianity. Then the development of human rights and liberalism over time depended entirely on Christian moral categories. So the Renaissance was not a rejection of Christianity, it was predominantly a movement in the fine arts. Nor was the Enlightenment a rejection of Christianity. The great scientific figures of the Enlightenment were almost all Orthodox Christian believers. The people who denounced religion in the Enlightenment were the literary propagandists rather than the, rather than the actual drivers of innovation in the Enlightenment. But the development of modernity in which we developed the categories in which we think fundamentally of human beings, human rights, equal dignity of all, a certain equality before the law, a certain 
respect for the large realm of conscience. All of these moral categories came directly out of Christianity and were not in the ancient world. So part of the propaganda of the Renaissance is that it rediscovered the moral beauty of the ancient world. That's not true. It did rediscover the aesthetic beauty of the ancient world, but the ancient world had never produced moral categories similar to those of Christianity, which became the basis for, modernized, for, for, for modern identity. So Larry Sittentop argues that by the latter part of the Middle Ages, by the 13th, 14th, 15th century certainly, everything that you need for modern liberalism had been already thought through in the internal Christian dialogue. The very centralisation of papal governance gave the idea to nation-state governance. Papal governance was much more competent than local feudal governance in those days, and the secular powers copied the patterns of canon law and, and, uh, and papal governance. All of the things, Sittentop argues, which we like about modern liberalism had been thought through by the, by the latter part of the Middle Ages. Now, that is a revolutionary view of Christianity. In my final couple of minutes, let me offer you this reflection. What then happens when you cut off every element of civic identity from its roots? For a time, you will live on the moral capital of the inheritance because you'll still use those categories, the sense of an objective good and evil, the sense of an absolute truth, of absolute standards, things which are absolutely wrong, uh, you know, like, um, like murder or, or, or infanticide or whatever. But over time, as, as a French uh, writer put it, society is trying to live off the scent of an empty vase. And once God is completely gone and all the Christian roots of liberalism are gone, in my view, liberalism goes mad because life becomes just uh, an ocean cruise in which you try to distract yourself until death. And a terrible boredom sets in about life, and human boredom is extraordinarily dangerous. I, uh, I think the atheist philosopher Peter Singer is a very fine philosopher, a very good person, but I think he's a very useful philosopher because he takes the logic of atheism through to its final conclusions in a... In a, in a in a way that is honest, which most atheist philosophers don't do. So he argues, for example, that handicapped children who are not wanted by their parents should just be left to die. And uh, I debated him on TV once about this. And he said, well, you know, a chimpanzee or a dog or a cat will have more utility about its life than a severely handicapped or indeed a very aged and ill uh, human being. And we were arguing this back and forth. And he said to me, but Greg, do you really think that just because they are members of our species, we should keep them alive. And I said, yes, that's exactly what I really think. Just being human beings means that they have a certain dignity which we have to respect in all circumstances. I think that Singer's position is the logical position that you get to without God. In the end, what you say to everyone is, well, just follow your own dream. And uh, if your dream involves murdering a thousand people or having sex with four-year-olds or whatever it be, there's no reason ultimately why your dream is any inferior to my dream. And the only thing that can mediate such conflicts then is power. The only thing that uh, adjudicates is not right and wrong, not any ultimate standard, but only power. And finally, I think without God, hum human nature loses both its distinctiveness and its universality. Because in the end, uh, without God, you revert back to the primal realities of self, family, and tribe, and there's no need to consider the rights of any other group. And that attacks the universality of human nature. But also, it attacks the distinctiveness of human nature, because without God, what are we? We're just another chancy outcrop in the biosphere with no more claim to consideration really than a cockroach. Now, the good news is uh, that's not the future which is inevitable. Nothing's inevitable and um, although Christianity is in decline in the West in my view at the moment, there are fantastically strong movements of new growth uh, 
and um, there's every reason to be hopeful. And I would conclude with the, with really the Irishman's anthem. The situation is uh, desperate, so we should advance on all fronts. Thank you. <laughs>
So the culture has just switched in the twinkling of an eye from being supportive to being hostile. The bishop has to navigate all that because he still has to give leadership. And finally, even in these very difficult times, he must proclaim the truth. He's got to proclaim the gospel. He's got to call the society to order. Uh, he doesn't exist to make uh, people feel good about themselves. He exists to tell them the truth. And, of course, if they embrace the truth, they will incidentally feel better about themselves. But his first uh, fidelity is to the truth. And um, my final reflection is I hope the bishops didn't mind me giving them all this free advice uh, in my book. <laughs> Mr Chair, I think you're uh, newspaper during the election campaigns have a number of articles on issues related to freedom of religion in Australia. Uh, I don't believe you've written about this topic recently. Can I ask generally where do you stand on the situation at the moment? And specifically, do you agree with Alan Jones' position on the treatment of Israel for now? So those are complex questions. I'm happy to answer them. But if I'm going too long, just get out a shotgun and shoot. You know. <laughs> so I'm a very strong proponent of freedom of religion. I haven't written about it lately, but I have written about it a lot in the past. And... Um, uh, I don't think that a social or legislative or political consensus exists to enforce in law many of the norms which we grew up with and love and still believe are norms. I don't ask the church to change its advocacy of any of those norms. I don't know that the legislative consensus exists for them. However, my primary concern, and where I'll fight side by side with the church, you know, to the last breath, is that the church, or all the church, the church speaking broadly, the Catholic church and all the Christian churches, must be free to proclaim its doctrine. So the, you know, the textbook example was uh, Archbishop uh, Porteus in um, Hobart issued this very gently worded uh, pamphlet, Don't Mess With Marriage. It was a very respectfully worded pamphlet. You could not take offence at it. And someone brought a complaint and he was going to be hauled before the Discrimination Commission. Now, eventually they withdrew the complaint, <coughs> tactically, but their complaint was that the mere existence of the pamphlet constituted discrimination against them. Uh, now, the only people who are responsible for making that complaint are the people who made the complaint. So we shouldn't label other people as responsible for that, but that is the nature of the campaign which will roll on to infringe religious freedom. You can see, you could imagine many, many different sorts of cases. Uh, schools might not be allowed to hire only teachers who subscribe broadly to their ethos or who at least don't campaign against their ethos. They might not be able to teach traditional doctrines. Adoption agencies might not be able to exercise the normal, uh, you know, Christian practices in their work. Now, I think the institutions must be very bold and vigorous in defence of their Christian identity. I think there is a broad challenge, though, that a lot of the institutions which are notionally Christian need to be a bit more upfront about, about coming out as Christian. Now, far be it from me to read moral lessons to anyone. I mean, what a, what a joke, a journalist reading a moral lesson to anyone. I mean, it's, it's almost ridiculous, you know. Well, no, no, it's not almost ridiculous. It's entirely ridiculous. <laughs> but one of the subtexts of the book is that I'm, I'd encourage Christians to come out as it were, to come out of the closet. If this is what they believe, this is what they should say. They should... Now, you need to speak sensibly to a secular audience and so forth, and you need to speak respectfully to people, but you should speak clearly about what you believe in. I wonder now whether all the Christian schools and hospitals and, uh, you know, old folks' homes and all the rest of it have not become so caught up in their institutional identity, and they do magnificent work, they're magnificent achievements. I'm in awe with admiration at them, but I wonder whether they haven't become so caught up in their institutional identity that they no longer proclaim uh, the gospel truths of Christianity. And uh, I think they should be willing to do that, otherwise they're not really Christian institutions. I can't imagine any Christian school which would not have at least one period a day of uh, religious instruction. We used to call it Christian doctrine, call it whatever you like, religious education or something. Yet I know that many, many Christian schools across all denominations don't do that. And you think, well, what, what are they doing that's more important than that if their purpose is a Christian purpose? Now, um, I 
am myself in two minds um, about whether specific freedom, legis freedom of religion legislation is a good idea or not. I honestly don't know. I can see strong arguments in both directions. We have had up till now a reasonably good um, situation which has been governed by convention, by exemptions from certain legislation and by common sense. Of course, the mad polarisations that we are living through today means that you can no longer rely on common sense and goodwill. Therefore, maybe you need to legislate more explicitly for things. But it's very hard to imagine legislation which couldn't be abused. Um, so would someone have religious freedom who espoused, uh, you know, that it's part of my religious belief that you should have nine, nine wives or nine husbands or that you should have sex with children or something. I'm giving you ridiculous examples, but, but it would be quite hard to frame legislation which could not be radically misused. The courts in the end wouldn't sustain that, but I, I just don't know. I, I, there are people I really respect on both sides of that debate. I'm tremendously influenced by the writings of Frank Brennan and Greg Craven and uh, Dyson Hayden and other people who've... Uh, but look, you'll find that's almost the only subject in the world where I don't have a dogmatic opinion. Um, <laughs> on the matter of Israel Folau, now I'll tell you honestly, I don't think Israel Folau should be sacked for life from rugby union. But I don't agree with what Israel Folau said. He did not just quote the scripture. Uh, he said homosexuals are going to hell. That's actually not true, and that's not church doctrine. Uh, the identity of being a homosexual can also apply to someone who has uh, same-sex attraction. Then the question of whether they're behaving well depends on what they do about that same-sex attraction. But if you simply say homosexuals are going to hell, I think you have a real risk of terrorising 14-year-olds and 16-year-olds and so on who may be struggling with their own... Um, um, sexual identity and, and you might make the crisis worse for them. Now that's not all he said of course, he said Christ is willing to forgive you and so on and, and that's, mind you, it doesn't matter that he disagrees with me theologically but I don't think he presented the orthodox Christian position, I think it's quite wrong to suggest that. And the other area that I disagree with him is that it's not up to him to decide who goes to hell or me or anybody else, God decides that. So you, it's quite right to say certain behaviour is, is wrong, the church teaches certain behaviour is wrong, but uh, the church has never taught, even in its magisterium, that it knows for sure. I mean, I suppose it's declared its confidence in the saints. Other than that, well, we'll, we'll all have to find out, won't we, in due course. And uh, so I think in two, two areas he was theologically wrong. I also think it's a stupid way to, to communicate a religious truth through a tweet, especially a, a religious truth as complex as that. But <coughs> having said all that in criticism of him, and I've not said anything publicly in criticism of him, he's obviously a fine young man, I still don't think he should lose his career permanently uh, for that. But um, uh, it, it is problematic. I think if he'd said promiscuous behaviour is absolutely wrong. Who could argue with that? But when you, when you take a category of people and say homosexuals are going to hell, I can't sign up to that, I'd, I'd have to admit to you. Sir. Yeah, just an observation. Uh, just in the, if you go to any cathedral, and in particularly St Mary's Cathedral, the number of young people that are in the cathedral at masses and other services lead me to think that Christianity can't possibly be in decline. You go to Notre Dame uh, in Paris, and it's absolutely packed with tourists. They must get some inspiration from being in there. And St Mary's Cathedral, they don't just go in as tourists, they go in there to pray. Well, you're right, and you're, you're absolutely right in the spirit of what you say. I'm with you 100%. You have to be optimistic for several reasons. God has given a promise to the church. The gates of hell will not prevail against you. So we can have confidence in God's promises. Secondly, if, if we're preaching... I, look, I, it's very strange for me to speak like this. You know, I'm, I'm much more comfortable dealing with Donald Trump and the Chinese <laughs> Communist Party. And stuff. But, but if Christians are preaching the truth, then they have an enormous advantage because deep in every human being is a responsive cord for the truth. 
So the truth is a tremendous force multiplier, there's no doubt. And it is in the character of young people that they respond to idealism and challenge and heroism. Having said that, it is nonetheless right for us to be smart, to understand our circumstances. You know, I spend a lot of time with military folks whom I admire enormously. They have a, a, a phrase, a term of art, situational awareness. What that means is the ability to integrate large amounts of information from many different sources in, a, in real time so that you can take actions on the battlefield which have strategic consequences. And the simple truth is Christianity is in radical decline in the West. I, I survey this sociological literature in the first chapter. It's quite a superficial survey, but, you know, we don't need to great detail about it. The number of 18 to 21 year old English people who identify as Anglicans now is 3%. 3%. The, uh, there are more Catholics go to Mass than Anglicans go to church on a Sunday in, in the UK now, but that's largely because the Poles have moved into England and they go to Mass on a Sunday, whereas native born English Catholics don't on the whole. In uh, the trends in Western Europe, Australia and New Zealand and the United States are exactly the same. So uh, 30 or 40 years ago, it was 80 or 90% believers. At the last census in Australia, it was 51 or 52% believed in God. But the uh, breakdown of those believers is overwhelmingly older folks. So um, each cohort that gets younger has a smaller proportion of believers. Now, some... Christian optimists try to massage the figures and say there is a category. So 30% say they absolutely are atheists. They believe in no God. 20 or 30% say something like, well, I'm spiritual, but I don't believe in God. And, you know, if you're inclined to this kind of casuistry, you can say, well, really, they're on our side, you know. But it's baloney, really. You've got to take people at their word. If they say they don't believe in God, they don't believe in God. And uh, church attendance, it's higher for Catholics than for any other denomination but it is in decline and it is predominantly amongst older folks. Now, at the same time, there are these fantastic movements amongst the young which are alive and which will build a new church. And I believe in the promise of the future, absolutely. But we are better able to deal with the circumstances of today if we recognise the situation we're in. And one, you know, I make a lot of tactical suggestions in the last chapter. One of them is that we should recognise that we are now a minority. We should be a bold minority. We should demand minority rights. And in demanding minority rights, we're not demanding rights for ourselves, we're demanding rights for the truth. Minorities have rights. I was doing a radio interview about this book on the ABC <laughs> once, and um, the interviewer was asking me about the Pentecostals, who I really think are terrific. I, you know, I'm a loyal son of the church, I'm an Orthodox Catholic, but I think the Pentecostals are great, I think they're fantastic. And um, she said, those Pentecostals, they, they are the people who, who believe that the Holy Spirit talks through them, aren't they? And I said, yes, that's right. She said, oh, I can't take them seriously. And I said, you know, I think you ought to have respect for people's deepest beliefs. And all of a sudden there was this terrible moment of cognitive dissonance in the ABC. She defended a minority. <laughs> Holy moly, she'd never thought of Pentecostals as a minority before. And so then she was backtracking at a million miles an hour and saying, oh, well, of course, yes, well, I do take them seriously. I have, I have the greatest respect, uh, even though I just said their most <laughs> fundamental beliefs are ridiculous. Uh, I, I now want to say that I have great respect. So that's not the solution to all our problems, but that's one tiny tactical suggestion. You'll be better off, you'll be better able to cope as a minority if you realise that you're a minority and take advantage of the tactical opportunities that that offers you. Probably have time for one more question. Any takers? Ma'am. This isn't on, on your talk, but I would like to know what you think about the plenary council, what will it do for the church? Well, look, um, I know almost nothing about the Plenary Council, which is normally a guarantee of a journalist having a lot to say. Uh, <laughs> you know, there's a kind of inverse relationship between how much we know and what we say. Um, so, look, I, I support the Plenary Council. I support the efforts of the bishops. I think that's fantastic. I, I honestly... 
You know, the, the genius and the wonder of the church in all its history, its fabulous diversity, its majestic uh, power and strength, has partly come from its um, coordinated and centralised nature. But the things that I find most promising in the current environment are not really top-down things. They're, they're bottom-up things. And I don't even mean by that that they're people in their local parishes telling the Pope what he should think or telling their Archbishop what he should think or telling the Bishop what he should think or anything like that. It's people actually just just creating Christian communities. You know, so there's this movement that I write about, uh, Focolare, which is Italian for fireside, which was founded in, in Italy in World War II, just people attempting to live according to the Gospels. Now, we're all trying to do that, but, but this is a very specific attempt by people living in community to live according to the Gospel. It's on fire. There are millions of Focolare members all over the world. There are communities in Australia. Fantastic. It's full of life and energy. And I think, in a way, it's we need the guidance and leadership of the church, absolutely, a million percent. But the thing which has caught my eye in this book has been this proliferation of movements, like this magnificent Campion College, which I'm so in love with. It didn't emerge as a policy of the church. It just emerged because a few Catholics saw there is no place for decent tertiary education around a Catholic uh, identity and a Catholic uh, sense of history and theology and literature and so forth. Now, of course, there are other, you know, there's Notre Dame, there's Australian Catholic University, so there are alternatives. But they produced this unique institution in Australia, a Catholic Great Books Liberal Arts College. Now, they could have gone the road of lobbying the bishops to do it, and make it a policy of the Australian Catholic Church, in which case they'd spend the next, you know, two or three hundred years arguing that case, or they could just do it. And they just did it, and there it is, and it's graduated hundreds of kids, and it's absolutely magnificent. So that's a long-winded way of saying I don't really know anything about the plenary council. <laughs> Thanks very much.